um, the stomach and, and, the, and the rectum can fight it out if you want, but um, there's a lot of blood vessels and a lot of things to be doing when you're operating down here. So this can be a fairly treacherous situation. Um, those of you that have been in the operating room with me will remember we talk about making the OK sign or out the IMA. Uh, there's a bare area back there, and that's kind of your window to start making the pelvic dissection. So let's see. Oh, we got to click back on the right window here, don't we? Yeah, we did. Maybe. Here we go. I want you to keep an eye on this kind of blue zone here um, because this is going to factor in into kind of the novel discussions about rectal cancer. Some of it not so novel, but uh, for those of you that have been real into this literature, but for the rest of us, um, something that's pretty new. So name, stage, treat, name, stage, treat, name, stage, treat. This is how you take care of every form of cancer. This will get you out of trouble on every exam you ever have. This will help you on your oral examination for the general surgery residents. This will help you break down any question on your written examination for the students. Once you have a biopsy, you cannot jump straight to treatment without doing the staging. It's the single most common mistake that people make on every exam ever. Um, they forget to do the staging workup. Traditionally in rectal cancer, the staging workup consisted of an ultrasound plus or minus an axial CT scan uh, almost always, uh, with the addition of some chemotherapy, some radiation, followed by surgery. And this is what treatment looked like for a very long time. For stage one, you either did a radical excision, traditional low anterior resection, or a local excision if it was low and small. Um, for stage two and stage three disease, um, so T3, T4 disease, or people that had known lymphadenopathy disease, um, you would do external beam radiotherapy, uh, usually coupled with uh, an oral prodrug of 5-FU called Zolota or capsidabine. Um, and then the, you would get your patient through surgery, and then they would go on to many months of systemic therapy. And then obviously for stage four disease, it depended kind of on a number of factors, things like what was the burden in the, you know, the burden of the disease in the liver, was the primary symptomatic, all this stuff. And this is what standard therapy for years looked like to give you a better idea. So when a patient would walk into our office with rectal cancer, you had to prepare them for at least a year long process. So if you look at the timeline in weeks here, before you, by the time they actually started treatment and they, they started with the oral chemotherapy and the external beam radiation, that would last four and a half to six weeks, depending. Then they'd have to have a break. Then they'd get one surgery and hopefully you can put them back together and give them a loop ileostomy. And then they'd have to have another break and then they get a whole bunch of adjuvant chemotherapy. And the total number of weeks here is far in excess of 40 because you gotta get these people through consultations and get them in to be seen. So there's probably about a month to six week lead time on the left side of your screen um, to even get all this process started. So this is what it's looked like for the longest time. Now it's radically different. We've gone from being able to make a diagnosis. Well, the pathology part of it's not that different but the staging part of it is radically different. We've abandoned ultrasound for pelvic MRI, and we're gonna talk in depth about some of these things. We've drastically altered the way that we administer chemotherapy and the way that it is sequenced. Um, we have delved into this persistent belief that we had for the longest time that extended periods of external beam radiation uh, to the pelvis was the correct thing to do in order for this disease to be controlled both distantly and locally. And we've also uh, begun to think about something called watch and wait. I found it interesting as I was looking for icons for this talk that the watch now looks like your Apple watch. It's not a clock face anymore. But um, people have started abandoning operating on this malignancy in favor of watching and waiting and see if it will resolve on its own. So this is the way that I conceptualize staging and treatment now. It's very convoluted. There's a lot of different choices. Um, and we've entered into a world where everything is a very, very nuanced discussion, both in terms of the nature of what you find during staging and the decisions that you make and the turns you must make as you go through to how to decide what, type, what sort of treatment someone will get. So traditionally, imaging for staging um, was broken down to two components. You had to do distant staging, meaning far away from the tumor, um, and local staging. The distant staging has almost always and remains to this day uh, a truncal CT scan with liver protocol, if you can get it, um, designed to look for lymphadenopathy, designed to evaluate the nature of the tumor, and also really you want to 
it's kind of essential that you determine what the liver disease burden is up front if the patient's going to have metastatic disease, because that can really alter how you're going to perform your operation. If you're going to think about doing uh, a combined operation with someone else, um, and how you're going to order the sequence of events. Um, and then traditionally we would do an ultrasound and an endorectal ultrasound uh, was uh, and has been a number of different things since I started this gig. Um, and the, it used to be a long rigid wand with a very small crystal at the end that rotated 360 and then it became this longer, more rigid, more invasive wand without the crystal, but a whole bunch of other stuff that would, um, you know, patients would take a look at what you were about to do and, and absolutely just about pass out. Um, and the characteristics of ultrasound are really good for determining the difference between T1 and T2 disease. So do you have a really thin tumor or a slightly thin tumor? If it's large in terms of pararectal nodes. So if you have a significant number of nodes around the rectum that are large in size. So we're looking for nodes in the mesorectum, that envelope that we'll talk about in a second that kind of holds everything together. Um, it's not really great for lateral pelvic lymphadenopathy. I haven't done one of these since 2016 that I can remember. Um, part of that is limitations of my own technical abilities. And part of that is uh, limitations of the tools needed. And part of that is also repetition. When you're doing this very infrequently, um, you just don't have the skills anymore to interpret what you're seeing and understanding. And there's other, other concepts behind that as well, because um, MRI has replaced this almost exclusively. And if I'm being very honest, uh, as I learned how to do this, I learned it well, but um, my own skill set tapered off as I did this with, le you know, with less frequency. And at the end, by the time I was done with it, I was doing both ultrasound and MRI to see if I was actually understanding what I was looking at. So now our distance staging is the same as you would expect. So we can find metastatic disease elsewhere in the body, but we now have protocolized um, radical cancer MRI. And this is not just your garden variety MRI that you can go and get off the street. Rectal cancer MRI has very specific protocols about the anglings of the magnet. It has to have certain technical aspects of the machine that you have to be able to provide for patients and provide for the radiologist so that they can interpret what they're seeing appropriately. It has to have um, any number of kind of parts of it, um, and those parts are not necessarily readily available. Um, and that can be fairly problematic because patients don't want to travel you know, two hours to get an MRI done. They want to get their MRI done at their local hospital, which may or may not provide appropriate imaging for interpretation of what rectal cancer actually looks like. So these are the different parts of a synoptic report for rectal cancer. And I do want to spend a little bit of time going over these because if this is good enough to make a synoptic report, it's got to be clinically relevant. One, the distance to the anal verge. How far is it to and from the anus? Is it involving a sphincter complex? Because that gives you an idea of maybe you're gonna have a window to be able to remove the tumor without taking the sphincters out. The relationship to the peritoneal reflection. So the area at the top, how near is it to um, actually entering the peritoneal cavity or not? Um, how long is it? What third of the rectum is it in? And then obviously a lot of the, what we call high risk features. Um, interestingly enough, as this has become, has become more and more sensitive, we can also determine whether or not there's mucinous components to this, which is a high risk feature, which was something that's happened um, since I've graduated. Um, and then we look at things like um, mesorectal fat involvement and fascial involvement. So there's a big plane of fat. There's uh, what we call the bread loaves that live behind the rectum. And we see if the tumor has invaded into that fat or even uh, through the fascia that separates the rectum from the structures in front. So these are what we call high risk MRI features. And these features are high risk because what we've determined over time is that people that have these features on MRI are much more likely not only to have local recurrence, but also have distant recurrence as well. So probably the thing that we worry most about surgically is whether they have a positive or a threatened circumferential margin. 
Um, and what, a, what that means is if you, because the rectum is basically this long cylinder that uh, when it was embryologically, the proctodium as it came down and inserted on the anal pit, um, this tube that formed, um, as it went down, it went down next to all these other uh, structures. And you have to worry if that margin is positive or if it's threatened that you're not gonna be able to get all the tumor out. Um, you want to know if it's T4, obviously, if it's invading what it isn't so that you can plan your procedure accordingly. If it's touching the bladder, if it's invading, involving the prostate, if it's potentially invaded the posterior wall of the vagina, we see that a lot. Extramural vascular invasion uh, and extra tumoral uh, tumor depth. So these are things that um, as we've done more and more uh, rectal cancer MRIs, we're developing tools that are similar to what we see on pathologic synoptic reports of uh, cancers that are bad actors and have bad biology. And then um, the other thing that has become of increasing import and, and of interest is the lateral pelvic nodal status of someone on an MRI. Um, and I have a couple of times in the talk where I say, hold please, because we'll get to the, uh, this in a little bit depth in a minute. So circumferential margin or positive margin is within one millimeter of the mesorectal fascia. So uh, for those of you that remember your anatomy and anatomy 101, um, you can remember that there is an investing fascia of the rectum. And what we're worried about is, is this tumor abutting or invading through this fascia because these, this fascial plane is what we use to follow to get the rectum out of the pelvis. If you have a threatened margin or a positive margin on MRI, this is not a pathology, this is MRI, you have a higher local recurrence rate of almost four times, three and a half times, and your overall survival is worse by twice. So we can, knowing that, we can help make treatment decisions about what to do. The reason we talk about the circumferential margin and its relationship to the rectum and able to, being able to do these operations goes back to Dr. Heald, um, at the Basingstoke Clinic um, in England. And he talked about the holy plane of rectal surgery. And basically what he described in his original papers and his presidential addresses to a number of societies was the concept of attempting to recreate that embryologic plane down toward the pelvic floor and attempting to follow those planes. Um, and if you read the original manuscripts, they're real interesting. Um, these are some of these are an updated version of his original cartoons um, that uh, have been kind of basically scraped over um, in order to darken them. But you can see how there's a lot going on, especially in, in the android as opposed to the gynecoid pelvis that you have to deal with. His original description of uh, this operation included removal of the entire mesorectum, independent of the location of the tumor all the way down to the pelvic floor um, with the idea that there were potentially innumerable tumor deposits that one could not see in the mesorectum and the nodal tissue back here. And of course, this was antedated significantly the more sensitive imaging modalities we have now to know whether or not that's the case. But as originally described, you independent of where the tumor was, you were going to go all the way down to the pelvic floor and then devascularize the backside of the rectum as you lifted that uh, tissue out. Um, and in one of his talks, I think this was real fun for those of us that like history and, and um, kind of classic literature, he talked about doing a total mesorectal excision, this kind of packet of removing the nodes in the rectum together as um, on the Odyssey where our hero is between Scylla and Charybdis. So you remember he's navigating a strait and there's two monsters, one on either side. And uh, Dr. Heald described the rock of the rectal cancer with tentacles extending out um, and trying to penetrate the rectal fascia. And then the other monster being the area outside the holy plane um, containing all the stuff that we wanna leave behind and not, not get involved in. Um, and then if you've ever been down uh, in that low part of the pelvis, I think you'll find this a fairly uh, apt description. So this is what a mesorectum uh, and a mesorectal excision should look like on the far left, kind of should look like in the middle and really shouldn't look like on the right. And so our pathology friends will give us a grade on how we do when we take the cancer out. And so it's incumbent upon us to produce a complete or near complete pathologic specimen uh, 
because we know that that will have a significant effect on the quality of the operation, oncologic outcome, et cetera. For the neophytes that come to do these operations with us, the way that I describe it is, imagine that the pelvic outlet is about the size of a Coke can. Um, it's maybe roughly that many centimeters across or whatever. And the rectum is about the size of a Red Bull can, depending. And so what you're attempting to do is to remove the Red Bull can from the inside of the Coke can without touching the sides of the Coke can as you pull the Red Bull can out. That's basically what you're trying to do. Oh, and oh, by the way, it's been radiated and stuck all to crap by everybody. So it's really difficult to, to achieve that. So um, hot off the presses in uh, Dr. Glandiac's journal from this month, um, one of the questions that has been asked is, does the completeness of that excision still matter um, as we've made significant changes to rectal cancer treatment in the past five, to seven years? Um, and interestingly enough, when you look at those patients that get incomplete mesorectal excisions, you would think that there would be a real significant difference in their local recurrence. And it's not that big, um, you know, and again, this is a single paper with a relatively, you know, modest sample size, but it's from a good institution uh, that, with good science. Um, and the place it makes a significant difference, it seems like, is in um, distant recurrence. Um, and I think the presses are um, still gonna be churning on this one for a while. Um, I think the answer is probably both because it's a marker of quality operations, but we'll see uh, what people pick up this paper and run with it uh, as time goes on. The traditional teaching and the teaching that you should probably still use for your oral boards on erectile cancer is distal margin. Um, we want a negative circumferential margin and a distal margin of about two centimeters. Um, realistically, based on a number of publications, presentations, and the kind of scuttlebutt at both um, uh, Society for Surgical Oncology, as I'm told, and then uh, my meeting at ASCARS, um, it really is, it's a less than a single centimeter. Um, it's really microscopically negative as long as the patient has been given radiation pre-op. Um, because in theory, as long as you can get to a negative margin, the remainder of that tissue should not contain malignant cells. Um, but again, hold please. We'll talk about that again in a minute. All right. So now these lateral pelvic lymph nodes that I've been talking about, what's up with this? So this um, dates back, there was originally some talk about this in the early 2000s, and then it kind of died out and now it's come back. Um, the cyclical nature of all science, it seems. So MRIs have given us a lot of unplanned for information. They're much more sensitive and they're much more specific. They're not great, um, but they're much better than what we had before. And because they're repeatable, um, we can get serial information over time. And in about you know, 10 to 20% of cases, we'll see patients that have these enlarged lateral pelvic lymph nodes that I think probably were not seen nearly as well or as um, it wasn't described as well with our previous imaging modalities as, as we have today. Um, if you want to just kind of figure out what does that mean for someone, it's basically the same as if they have classical N2B disease with a very, very high local recurrence rate. And about 40% of these people um, with lateral pelvic nodes, um, even if they've been treated appropriately, either with spot radiation or hopefully with surgery, um, will still have uh, a local recurrence only. And so knowing that it can, it can kind of change your treatment paradigm as you think about what to do with these people, you might favor um, some different radiation options or some different chemotherapeutic options, knowing that that patient is a higher chance for a local recurrence. So what do you do with these lateral pelvic lymph nodes? Um, let me get to that picture here real quick. This is what you do with them. Um, and the reason that you do this is because of the data I'm going to show you in a second. But the first time I saw a picture like this and I saw someone doing this minimally invasively, might I add, I had a bit of a heart stop because um, while our urology colleagues do this with some frequency, it's not something I'm super familiar with. And I look at doing something like this in a radiated pelvis um, and I, I'm kind of taken aback by um, some of the videos that I've seen of people doing this procedure because if you notice at the base of this dissection, 
there's buckets and buckets of these vicral clips that are just chilling out on branches of the internal iliac artery in order to get this nodal packet here out. They've also completely skeletonized the obturator nerve here. And in doing so, um, uh, it's, you know, you have to tell these patients that that nerve has a very high likelihood that it's just not going to function. Um, when we look at these lymph nodes on MRI, um, what they look like is they have irregular borders, um, a heterogeneous signal intensity, and a round shape. Now, how you get irregular borders and a round shape together, I don't know, but that's what this says. Uh, that's what the data would say. And uh, the larger the lymph nodes are in uh, relationship to uh, number bears into whether or not we consider it lateral pelvic nodal disease. So you can have one big one or multiple medium ones or a whole lot of small ones. When you look at how this performs um, on an MRI and the predictive value of the MRI once the nodes are taken out, the data is all over the place. Some people say that 80 to 90% of the time those nodes are positive. Other people say it's only about 30% of the time and it's all kind of side effect of pretreatment or whatever. Um, and so as a result of that, people look at this and say, well, okay, if it's all over the place and the data is kind of, you know, not really equaling out or kind of agreeing with itself, what do you do with that? So um, when you look at patients that have this disease um, on pathology, not on MRI, right? So the way that I thought of this was I was kind of trying to conceptualize this as the original idea of is it local disease control versus is it diagnostic? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, right? So the answer is it's both local disease control because people that have um, positive lateral pelvic nodal disease have worse overall survival and significantly increased risk for local recurrence um, as well. And so it's both a diagnostic thing and it's also a therapeutic thing. So um, this is gonna become something that is much more common and prevalent um, as we detect more and more of this um, and people get more and more MRIs. Um, but the problem with doing something that looks like this is what the patient outcomes are. Now I'm used to doing morbid operations, right? I didn't go into colorectal surgery not to do something morbid, right? That's what I do. Um, but the morbidity of this operation is just the nodal dissection. I'm not talking about the flaps for the APRs and all this, just the nodal dissection itself after all the treatments that they receive, you have a 40% chance of being complete, having complete urinary incontinence. This is not partial, this is complete urinary incontinence because that obturator nerve never comes back, okay? You have an 80% risk of sexual dysfunction, both men and women, okay? Vaginal atrophy, all that stuff. And the learning curve for this is pretty steep. Now, if I had to do it, could I? Yeah, probably. Would it be great? No, it wouldn't be the best one that anybody had ever done. And the, the end of these currently is low enough in clinical practice that I don't know the degree to which, um, you, you know, the average colorectal surgeon should be doing these things out in practice without some significant thought and consideration behind it. All right. So this is what staging now looks like. So we've been through some of the staging stuff, but guess what? We have to stage again. And that's new. We used to get people staged one time and we used to make all of our treatment decisions based off staging someone out the gate. Well, now we're gonna take everything we've just done and we're gonna completely redo it. We're gonna rescope everyone. We're gonna re-MRI everyone um, after they've undergone that neoadjuvant treatment that we saw in the first diagram. And remember that we're now up to four preps Okay, so we got to prep for the MRI and we got to prep for the scope. And um, insurance companies don't want to pay for this. They absolutely hate the fact that we want to restage people, even though there's a significant number of national guidelines around doing this, um, because they argue that if, it, if our treatment decisions were good enough based on uh, initial staging five to seven years ago, that doing this is kind of ancillary and unnecessary. So why? Are we asking for them to pay this money? And why are we asking our patients to go through restaging after going through all this treatment up front? And it's because of this. It's because of the concept of watch and wait. So if you want to boil this down to a nutshell, the, the concept is that we're going to take all of the treatment that we give patients 
And instead of taking them to the operating room, just knee jerk first off, you're gonna follow them clinically over time to see if the chemotherapy and the radiation doesn't make their tumor turn into nothing, like a scar, essentially. So up to about 20% of patients will have what we call a clinical complete response, meaning that when you go to look for tumor, either in the nodes or in the lumen or both, or in the mesorectum actually, um, you can't find anything. And this correlates uh, with pathologic uh, findings as well. So you can have what we call a pathologic complete response, a PCR versus a C complete response or a clinical CR, okay? Um, and about, interestingly enough, when you do a retrospective review of this, about 75% of the people that have a clinical complete response, meaning no evidence of actual tumor, either on imaging or on endoscopy and exam, still have residual tumor cells within that specimen. But because of the desire to see what happens with those people over time, um, the, the concept has emerged that what we'll do is we'll watch those people, even with viable tumor cells present, knowing that, and if the tumor cells continue to grow and don't die, then we'll, sal we'll give them salvage surgery. And a lot of this work comes from uh, a very innovative uh, surgeon named Dr. Angelita Abergama, uh, and she has um, been a hero to many in our discipline because she had um, kind of the courage to stand up and say, as she was noticing a significant number of these patients were having these pathologic and clinical complete responses not to operate on them. Um, I don't know that I would have felt the same, but I'm, uh, many patients have been grateful that, that she was able to lead the charge in this. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at the papers that she originally published out of her group, um, she included people with advanced disease, so T2 to T4 disease, and she followed them very, very closely for a very long period of time. Um, this is the kind of breakdown of the original publication. So she had 183 patients, 90 of whom had a clinical complete response eight weeks after chemo radiation. Now that's much higher than we get here. Um, and you can attribute that to any number of different things. You can attribute that to different radiation protocols. They also use adriamycin-based chemotherapy and not um, uh, you know, traditional oxaloplatin-based chemotherapy. Um, so, but of those 90 patients, about 30% of them had a local recurrence within five years. Um, of those 28, um, a significant uh, number were able to be salvaged with the rare patient um, basically developing either unresectable or, um, you know, disease that ended up being R1 after attempted salvage. So a big chunk of the patients that had recurrence were able to be quote unquote salvaged or um, kind of turned back into the regular pathway. So how did they detect recurrence? They did an exam in rigid procto every one to two months for the first year, every three months and every six months, CEA, and then um, staging every six months and then yearly. So can we really do this? Um, you know, as I think about this in my own practice, I can count the number of people that have, um, that I've wanted to do this for, that have been interested in doing it probably on one to two hands. Um, and it, get, it makes me significantly nervous. When you look at our own practice guidelines issued forth by our professional society, um, this is what they say. 75% um, of the people will have a microscopic focus of cancer at resection. The two-year overall pooled recurrence in these patients is only around 15%. So there's a significant discordance between those microscopic findings and the ability of this tumor to come back. Almost 20% of these people will have persistent nodal disease. And we see that independent of whether or not we're doing watch and wait, especially for T2 plus disease. When you look at the outcomes in European and Western countries, the successful uh, overall survival for watch and wait is much lower than it is for people that undergo surgery. And of the patients that develop a local recurrence, 36% um, of them were on watch and wait. Um, and sorry, of the patients developing local recurrence, 36% of those patients had metastatic disease at the time of recurrence if they had watch and wait versus 1% um, that had surgery. So here's my bias. Um, I learned in this room a long time ago that solid organ tumors are cured by surgery uh, with the exception of PD-1 inhibitors. Um, patients that have lower risk pathologic features are probably more likely to be successful with watch and wait. Um, you have to have a very, very compliant patient. 
Um, the morbidity of the surgery in a frail patient may outweigh the risk of recurrence depending upon the nature of your patient. Um, I will be very honest in that if you have a very frail patient who could not tolerate the morbidity of a surgery that they desperately need, I have been known to invoke this as a potential out for them um, for any number of reasons. Um, and then if you're going to do this document, 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 not only your findings, but your discussion with the patient. So chemotherapy and radiation are so powerful. What if we just start messing up and messing around with everything? So this is the way science occurs as we mess around and find out. So let's, let's, now that we know that this is successful, if watch and wait is possible, then let's see what happens if we change things like the order of chemotherapy. Maybe we omit some types of treatment um, and we change the type of radiation we give people. So this has led to the creation of something that we call TNT or total neoadjuvant therapy. So the idea is that you could potentially downstage locally advanced disease um, and you could eliminate the probability or possibility of surgical morbidity potentially limiting your treatment options. And that's a very fancy way of saying that if a patient has a leak, they never make it to chemo. Um, it gives the patients a chance for a pathologic complete response. And more patients, if you do it this way, will actually complete the chemo, their, their full course of chemotherapy. Um, kind of most famously for this, there's a European trial that said only about 45% of patients in the classical modality with adjuvant therapy at the end actually completed all that therapy because by the time they got to chemotherapy, they're completely burned out both mentally, physically from all the stuff we've done to them. So um, multiple reviews of this have been undertaken over the course of the past five to seven years. And the majority of them now favor giving all of the chemotherapy for patients that need it upfront. So you have a greater uh, likelihood of developing a pathologic complete response and a clinical complete response. You have better disease-free survival with preoperative chemotherapy, as well as better overall survival with preoperative total neoadjuvant therapy. So this is now pretty much the standard for people that have any sort of locally advanced disease or for people that may not have locally advanced disease, may have nodal disease, or some mixture of both. Um, and if you wanna know how good it is, this is how good it is. It's so good that um, the senior people in this room will recognize this type of diagram without me having to explain it to them. For the junior people in the room, this, these are the NCCN guidelines. This is what they look like when you go to pull up um, the guidelines for how to treat people with cancer. So for patients with T3 disease, uh, with any N with a clear circumferential margin or patients with any nodal disease of any kind on MRI, total neoadjuvant therapy is now preferred as the uh, primary course of treatment. And then there's this big box that uh, looks like a Surgeon General's warning at the bottom that says in patients who achieve a clinical complete response with no evidence of residual disease on examination, you can do all this very uh, invasive workup. And basically what this box is outlining is how to do watch and wait for these patients. Um, and their surveillance recommendations are the following, uh, proctoscopy and exam every three to four months and uh, MRI recommended every six months for three years. So you've got to have a really compliant patient, a really interested patient and someone that you can trust to come back and get these frequent exams because if they don't, then they're going to end up with a pelvic recurrence or a distant recurrence, one of the two. So surely that we're just doing this for T3 and T4 disease or node positive disease. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, we're giving total neoadjuvant therapy for patients with you know T3, T4 uh, disease, um, but surely we're not doing that for patients with you know T2 disease and no nodes. I think you can make a compelling argument that that's actually the way to go. So who gets classical treatment then anymore? Um, some patients that are averse to radical resection completely, you can make an argument that giving them classical therapy with all this bucket of radiation up front might work um, because all of the data around pathologic and clinical complete response um, had to do, was kind of coming out of the original classical treatment era. Um, and then you might give it to some patients with T1 that have high risk features, um, uh, sorry, T2 patients, uh, sorry, T1 patients with high risk features that are averse to uh, big surgery. Um, but pretty much anybody else is going to get total neoadjuvant therapy. 
these days. So if that's true, do we really need all that radiation as well? So we've decided we're gonna take the, treat the, the chemotherapy and put it up front. So how much radiation do we need? We actually need all four to six weeks of, of radiation. So the rectum is uh, a capacitance organ, okay? Um, and a capacitance organ is one like the stomach. It's meant to distend, contract, do behave like a balloon essentially. And if you take uh, a rectum and you radiate it or you cut most of it out, what you end up with is something that has no capacitance, it has no compliance. It basically takes a balloon and turns it into a lead pipe. And so these patients get something called low anterior resection syndrome. Um, and low anterior resection syndrome is a horrible way to live. And if you've not heard of it, God bless you, because you've never had to take care of patients that come in and complain about spending, you know, anywhere from 90 to 180 minutes every morning on the toilet, having these tiny clustered micro movements of, uh, and are fecally incontinent and just have very miserable lives. So long course radiation, the traditional thing that we would give in the original kind of diagram is um, a whole bucket of radiation, 5,400 centigrade, delivered over a number of weeks. Um, and it's expensive, it's debilitating, it makes operating difficult. Um, it's usually accompanied, like I said, by an oral pro drug of 5-FU. Um, and then you have a waiting period and then you operate on it. Uh, and you might be more likely to save the pelvic organs um, but it's sure going to make operating down there a lot more risky and a lot more problematic. Also, if you've got someone who has to have radiation every day for five to six weeks, it can make it difficult depending upon how far or near they live. We run into this all the time. Short course radiation is only given over five days. There's less cost. It's not as debilitating. There's no other chemotherapy that is uh, delivered at the time of that uh, radiation. And you don't have to have a waiting period and logistics are, period, are better. So if that's better, why not use it all the time? So these are the questions that people are asking over the past three to five years. Um, and uh, a couple of notable publications have come out. This is uh, a visual abstract from DCR that talks about this in stage two and three rectal cancer. Um, patients were uh, given either standard or neo, uh, you know, TNT therapy, followed by short course radiation versus standard and long course radiation. And the patients that got TNT and short course radiation had uh, higher rates of pathologic complete response, and a significant number of them were more able to complete their treatment. They had total less time with an ileostomy, but their local recurrence rate was the same. But I think you can make an argument that um, that pathologic complete response and uh, complete, completing of treatment rate, um, as well as less ostomy time, can make this a you know fairly compelling thing. At the same time that our friends at WashU were doing this, we had uh, the RAPIDO trial, because you have to have a fancy name for your trial, um, that talked about adding the same. This is a European trial uh, with a much higher end. They had uh, roughly equal numbers of patients getting TNT uh, and short course versus standard long course with pretty good follow-up of three years. And the short course radiation with TNT had uh, fewer treatment-related failures, a lower rate of distant metastatic disease, um, again, no difference in local failure, so that seems to bridge the pond, and uh, no difference in overall survival. But again, uh, about a 28 to versus a 15% uh, pathologic complete response rate. So if that's good, do we even need radiation at all? So this is a trial that came out this month, um, the PROSPECT trial. So this is a trial that um, uh, aims to eliminate radiation completely. So you had uh, roughly 1,200 patients that were randomized into two groups, one to receive just full box with selective use of chemo radiotherapy versus those that were to receive standard treatment. Um, and this was a non-inferiority study um, that looked at the elimination of short course completely and only included patients with T2 and T3 disease. Um, and these were exclusion criteria, uh, as you can see there. Um, and that makes sense, I think. But the interesting thing is they said that the chemotherapy alone has to shrink the tumor by 20% or they were moved to traditional chemoradiotherapy. I find this a little bit problematic because 20%, how do you determine what 20% is? Is it by MRI, is it digital exam, endoscopy, all of that together? Um, but if they didn't shrink by 20% at their predetermined time point, then they were moved to traditional therapy. Um, despite my objections, they were able to show that there is 
Um, not much difference in the full Fox group and the chemo radio group um, for disease-free survival, overall survival, and local recurrence. So maybe chemo is the magic thing. We don't need radiation at all anymore. Time will tell. So now what we've gone from is something that uh, was pretty rote and pretty simple into something that is more costly to do with more frequent exams, needing more compliance for patients. Um, we have, we still don't really know what to do with radiation at this point because it's kind of up in the air. I think where we end up coming down on this is that um, for patients that were worried about having pelvic recurrence, you're probably more likely to give them uh, more radiation versus patients that you're worried about having a distant recurrence, um, you're more likely to give them short course radiation so you can get them in the operating room sooner. Um, all right, I got a little bit of time left. And so we're going to actually talk about surgery now in a surgical grand rounds. Shocker. All right. Um, this is this, this is on your boards. This is on your app site every year. They want to know about the criteria for local excision. You have to have a team one tumor with no nodes and it has to be less than three centimeters in size. That's obviously got to be mobile and not fixed to stuff. You want it to be within eight centimeters of the anal verge and less than a third of the circumference of the rectum. And you really have to be able to do full thickness excision. I hate this. Dr. Jordan hates this. Um, I think Dr. Kavalukas hates this. And the reason why is because if you do this and you have to go back later, it takes something that would have been in the right hands, a fairly nice and elegant operation and turns into an absolute war to get the rectum out of that pelvis because you've done a full thickness excision and the intactness of the mesorectal planes, even though they're below the investing fascia can be really difficult to achieve. Um, loop ileostomies. Um, this is always something, I think it's a little bit point of confusion and it's also something that's kind of on the cutting edge. So for those of you that don't know, we're gonna take the rectum we're gonna staple it off and basically create a low, closed loop obstruction. And then um, we're gonna put an anastomosis down there with a distal obstruction in it. And for those of you that know the mnemonic friends, uh, friends make fistulas happen. And so I've got a built-in distal obstruction to half the anastomoses I make in my life. And that's what leads to um, any number of problems. So the way to obviate that problem is to divert the the fecal stream up, uh, you know, above it with a loop ileostomy. Now this doesn't get you out of trouble in terms of a leak. Leaks still happen, but it takes and it turns a problem that would otherwise be, a, you know, potentially life-threatening case of pelvic sepsis and turns it into this kind of protracted fight with um, posterior um, pelvic sinuses and whatnot. So if we can get rid of radiation potentially and we can change the way chemotherapy goes, can we just get rid of loop ileostomies now? Um, and so this is uh, a paper from uh, a similar group that uh, is attempting to do TNT in short course uh, over in Europe. And this is their uh, in-house data about the number of leaks versus their um, loop ileostomies. Um, this gives me pause personally, um, because I think their population is very different than my own. Um, but with that said, this is what their data shows. Um, they show that the patients that don't have a defunctioning stoma have um, a higher anastomotic leak rate, which I think makes sense. Um, but the patients that do have a stoma have a uh, greater rate of admissions to intensive care. Um, that's probably a proxy variable for the fact that their patient was sick and they decided to give them a loop stoma to help them out. But it also has to do with the fact that a loop stoma, if you've been on our service, is a significantly dehydrating thing and patients can come in with uh, acute kidney injury and hyponatremia um, and uh, be really, really sick, even just from the act of uh, diverting all of the stool away from their colon. And of course, the things that go along with that higher readmission and whatnot. My ideas about this, um, the only time I would not give someone a loop ileostomy is um, it better be technically near perfect. There's no perfect operation, but it's got to be close. Um, they need to have minimal risk for local or distant recurrence because if they develop a leak, those risks are going to go up. Um, so things like you need to know before you go into the operating room if they have things like lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion on their biopsy, tumor grade, and budding, those sort of things. You don't want to be doing this in someone who's got a threatened margin, obviously. Um, and you don't want to potentially instigate a delay in treatment because if you don't give them a loop and they've got a leak, now we're in trouble. Hopefully they're in the TNT category and won't be a problem, but you never know. Robotic surgery. Um, so this is obviously a passion of mine. So I learned it from Dr. Jordan and he learned it in Italy from the people that basically invented it. 
So in 2023, this is kind of the year that we have made the big transition to robotic surgery and rectal cancer. So um, according to a number of data that come out of our own professional society, we estimate that 70% of all proctectomies this year will be done robotically. Um, and that's up from about 55% three years ago. This has become the way to do a lot of pelvic surgery anymore these days. And there's cost associated with it and there's time associated with it. There's a significant learning curve. Um, and I agree to all of those things. And I also agree that you will pry it out of my cold dead hands. Um, is it the same as laparoscopic surgery or open surgery? So um, yeah, basically, I mean, uh, I could get into the data about all this, but I think it really is how can you personally get a good margin on the tumor? Um, I think that if your abilities are laparoscopic and you can get a good margin that way, great. If your abilities are robotic and you can get a good margin on it that way, great. Um, but plenty of people have made the argument that robotic surgery um, is equivalent to other minimally invasive forms of surgery. Um, this is just kind of a... Uh, scatter plot of the ideas that have come, the trials that have come, comparing open versus laparoscopic and open versus robotic surgery and how it comes. Um, about 2014, 2015, there were a couple of trials published that could not establish non-inferiority for uh, laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery for rectal cancer. Um, and those have since that's been hotly debated in our in our world because a lot of people still practice laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Other papers have come out refuting that, but those were fairly large trials that were fairly well known. And so uh, I remember getting a copy of the a la carte trial in my inbox and running down the hall to Jeff going, oh, my God, we're out of business. Um, what about AP resections in the robot? This is kind of interesting. Um, so we're doing more and more AP resections where you're going to remove the entire anal sphincter complex. Um, and giving people a colostomy using robotic techniques. Um, and when you look at the outcomes, there's a lot less perineal morbidity. Um, we're doing a lot less flaps in these patients because you're able to perform the transphenteric resection through a much smaller incision because um, as, as Jeff would say, you can bovie as much as you want until basically you're going through the pelvic floor and you just kind of cut until you hit air on the robot and you're looking at the, the you know, first assist through the patient's uh, perineum, essentially. Um, as it always is case in robotics, you have fewer pelvic nerve complications because they're much more easy to identify, but obviously the cost is going to be much higher. Now, that's the cost for the robot. I don't know about the cost of the second surgeon that might be obviated is needed for uh, flap reconstruction of the perineum because we're doing that less. Um, one other thing that's out there that not a lot of people have heard of, um, we don't practice this here because we have the robot and we don't need to, is something that's called transanal TME or total mesorectal excision where we take out that fat pad around the colon. Um, and what we do in transanal TME is you go and you make a purse string below the tumor and using laparoscopic techniques, you create this kind of yellow incision plane around the rectum and you free it up and you usually have two teams working, one from the top and one from below and they kind of meet in that embryologic plane that Dr. Heald talked about. And by doing that, free the entire rectum up and then you uh, pull it out uh, through the anal canal, divide it and then do your stapled anastomosis that way. Um, there are some countries that have outlawed this as a technique because um, the problem is, is if your purse string is not real good, the retrograde insufflation from below can actually seed the pelvis with tumor um, as you're blowing air from below, trying to keep the rectum insufflated so that you can uh, get a good dissection. A uh, couple of last minute pearls. Don't be afraid of a low Hartman. It's always stood me in, in good stead. You can always come back later um, if you ever get to. Urinary stents identify injuries. They don't prevent them. Um, so don't use that as an excuse for poor technique. People don't like pelvic drains. I, I use them very, very liberally. Um, and I think it can be a lifesaver uh, or a potential nightmare, depending. Um, and if you're stuck, uh, phone a friend. I'm always here. I want to come help. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. The, qu the picture on the left is one for one of my patients. The picture on the right is when I asked my seven-year-old what I do for a living. The, this is the picture he drew. And this is the septa buttipus. Um, this is a picture of me as a seven-armed octopus with butts for hands. <laughs> we have to take any questions. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, comment on the role of uh, mismatch of perigene, MSI high, rectal cancer, how that changed your approach and maybe your, uh, your sure. consideration of watch and wait. Yeah, so patients that have known mismatch instability, so things like, you know, being, having elevated, uh, you know, being MSI high, as we have moved to routine genetic testing for patients, um, those patients are going to be, uh, you know, that kind of falls into the high risk feature category. So I'm going to have much higher threshold, to, you know, to bring them into watch and wait versus those that don't. Um, and so we know from any number of, uh, you know, kind of studies that patients that have MSI high tumors are probably going to have worse biology. They're going to be more chemo and radio resistant. And so trying to bring them into a watch and pray protocol, I think is the wrong thing. And immunotherapy in those patients, standard, yes, no? Uh, to, to be determined. So some people are getting different types of immunotherapy for this. It's probably not very effective. It's kind of last ditch stuff. Dr. Uh, Lanier. Yeah, So uh, you know, I'm very upfront with them and I tell them that they're, you know, potentially present. And so basically, you know, I tell them what they're trading is a potential greater chance of, you know, clinical response and a better outcome for, um, you know, the fact that they're going to be potentially exposing themselves to things like peripheral neuropathy, you know, altered taste sensation, all that other sort of stuff. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there's no free lunch when it comes to this type of cancer. I mean, it is, you're, you're always borrowing from one thing to pay the other. Um, there's no, there's no really elegant way uh, out of that. Dr. Cavalucas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farmer. Um, I'm curious about the mechanism of changing you know, standards of how we treat patients, and I'd like to present the data that changed over time. I think a selfish question for my part is I kind of looked into, let's say, lateral pelvic disorder. I think it does start gaining speed as you say thing. I mean, I looked into it three thousand dollars for an eight-hour course, and every like two months, maybe so four of us have one patient that have a lateral pelvic disorder. So how do how can I change the time frame and acquire the skill? Because even though I've got a model of how they can do that, that was four years ago, and I don't even see that I've been able to do it on a patient on the level. Uh, I mean, I think the answer to that is, I mean, well, the, and, you know, you can say phone a friend. I mean, I know people like Jamie and a bunch of other, you know, some Saeed and the urology folks do these dissections routinely. And I think until we get super proficient with this, like what I'm going to do is just going to, I'm going to be booking these cases with them be like, hey, come help me do this because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it won't hurt that they can take the fall for all their urologic complications as well when that happens. I've shot into lateral pelvic lymph nodes with a whole lot like uh, those lymph nodes that we take out for other diseases. Uh, any comments? Indeed, they do, and it's a real challenge to get the back in there and take off. Well, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. I struggle with the sequencing of therapy when the patient has polyp metastatic liver disease. Mm -hmm. The rectal cancer with the solitary liver metastasis. What's your approach for staging the chemotherapy and plus monitoring radiation in that patient? So, I mean, I think that in that patient, um, you know, I think that especially with 
what we've seen with the success of short course recently, the way I would approach that would be uh, one to walk down the hall and find you and ask you to tell me what to do. Um, but in written reality, uh, I would say it depends on whether their liver disease is resectable or not, in your opinion, and kind of treatment for that. I know that, um, you know, we can see if they're a disease responder, all that sort of things like that to chemo. But ultimately, the thing that I think about for my part of it and actually getting the rectal cancer out is getting them through whatever sort of treatment we need for their, you know, metastatic disease to their liver first. Um, I'm more of a believer of the Anderson data than some of the data from other places in that if you can get, you know, an oligometastatic disease under control, um, the biology of colon cancer is such that um, it's not going to get completely out of control in other places, hopefully. Um, and so you get that under control first um, and talk to medical oncology about, you know, the ordering of the, you know, how you want to give them the systemic therapy between then and how much they want to give before we take the rectal cancer out. And then you give them short course and then get them an OR. That's the way I, I, mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, in my mind, it's get the liver taken care of first, systemic therapy, short course surgery. Last question. Training. So you just sat here and thought, wow, how am I ever going to get that? I just spent a whole year trying to get this. And so it comes down to the and we can test the world war. And the best thing that you can do is get a and get closer to the first thing you can do is get a little bit of 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 a little bit you have to rehearse scenario, uh, you know, oral board question scenarios here to help crystallize your knowledge. If you don't, and go to clinic and comment. All right, thanks, Dr. Farmer, for a great grand round. Appreciate it.